Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So today is going to be the last uh, lecture because next week we'll have uh, presentations from students. Um, so I should say last uh, lecture on, on material because we'll, we'll still be meeting next week. Um, so today I thought that we might try something a little bit different. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, but hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully folks can can participate. So I wanted to make this more kind of uh, discussion oriented uh, today. Um, so basically all the stuff that we've we've covered um, so far is, is kind of culminating a lot in in the last couple lectures thinking about um, policies, but I was hoping that you guys could have your own sort of little go at this. And so what I want to do today is to go through uh, a, a kind of slew of other policies that we haven't sort of yet discussed, and then we can talk about um, how we can apply some of the stuff that, that we've learned from class or sort of thinking about policy analysis in, in general and, and uh, see what you guys come up with. So um, yeah, so applying our, our modeling knowledge for policy analysis, um, how can we apply critical thinking and analysis to a bunch of other policies? Um, and I think this is, a good sort of way to start uh, thinking critically about the sort of usefulness of, of a lot of things that, that we've talked about in sort of making policy better or even sort of making policy um, more understandable and, and, and efficient. And so, you know, we've, I think we've talked a lot about um, these these concepts, but sort of bringing it all together. So economic analysis. Um, I think the idea of, of cost benefit analysis is um, I think a fairly easy to understand concept, especially for for stakeholders. Um, but in principle, it can be a lot trickier, right? Then um, it's easier said than done. Uh, monetary analysis over time, thinking about all the discounting and, and sort of uh, financing analysis that, that we did. Um, hopefully, you guys have come to the realization that, that a lot of that analysis can be really uh, assumption driven. And so it's important to uh, keep that in mind when doing your own or thinking about other analyses that, that folks have done. We've talked a lot about technology and, and fuels. Um, and I think one of the important things is having a sort of basic understanding of, of how it works because that provides a lot of context in relation to um, how that technology may interact with other technologies. Um, thinking about beyond just the sort of technology itself, but if there is like a support infrastructure for it. Uh, and then we, we also talked about uh, how technologies can get adopted, um, you know, how long will that take, uh, what, what expectations can we have about that um, technology over time. Um, decision making, uh, so risk analysis, <laughs> when we think about a lot of the economic stuff, um, I think one of the things that that is a little bit more nuanced that may not always show up in in some of these analyses is sort of the decision making process for different types of individuals. So if we think about, you know, for like electric vehicles, for example, if you're going to be buying them for a fleet of vehicles, or if you're going to be thinking about individual ownership, right, that ownership structure can be really different, right. And so depending on your stakeholders, your decision-making process can be uh, can can vary quite a bit, um, and then understanding things about the utility function. We we didn't get into sort of specifics about how 
utility functions are formulated, but we did talk about you know different risk preferences, and that can be important in in a lot of this um, decision making. Um, uncertainty and sensitivity. What parameters have uncertainty? How should we treat it? Um, so there's a couple different techniques that that we've talked about, but I, you know, taking a sort of sort of further up view, I think it's just um, the the most important thing is is uh, having knowledge that it is important to incorporate uncertainty in, into your analysis, however you sort of end up wanting to do it. Um, and what scenarios can be considered, right? Instead of just having sort of one particular type of outcome. Uh, there are other things to consider, actually one that I probably should have included at, now that I'm thinking about it, um, impact analysis. So a lot of what we've talked about is uh, emissions. Um, and so that includes both um, climate change pollutants, uh, but also local air quality pollutants um, and, and that that is a sort of uh, really common metric to think about these days, especially as climate change is dominating a lot of policy. Um, but there are also other types of impacts. Another one that's becoming very popular is thinking about um, equity, uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, and yeah, and, and, and sort of sustainable sustainability but not at the at the cost of um you know affecting specific communities in, in certain ways um yeah and so general overview and, and hopefully we can think about a lot of these um these impacts uh and, and different elements um as we look into some of these these policy examples okay so uh, and, and, and so a lot of these policies that I'm going to talk about, um, some of which I have a lot of familiarity with, and, and, and some I'm sure actually you guys may, may know a lot more than, than I do. Um, and, and so it'll be good to, to have a, a, a nice discussion about this. Um, so the first one is fee baits, kind of starting in an area where I, where I do know a little bit about. So this is, um, the combination of a fee and a rebate, um, hence the fee bait, uh, in, in the transportation realm where it's kind of most discussed and, and most popular, um, the way this works is, you know, if, if, I, if I buy a fuel efficient vehicle, um, then I have to pay a fee and that fee is used as the pot of money that goes as a rebate for people who buy fuel efficient vehicles. Um, so this is uh, a, a pretty hot top or is continually being a, a hot topic um, in, in the policy world uh, because for example, the, like the California has these, has these rebates but they use cap and trade money and, and it's, there's always uncertainty about whether or not it's still gonna be around and there's delay in payments because sometimes they don't have the sort of uh, funding stream set up correctly. Um, yeah, and so example of, of existing fee baits include, um, uh, so it's also known as this bonus malice system uh, in France, in Sweden, Canada briefly had it. Um, and I believe there's a, a couple other regions that have um, the examples of these fee baits. Um, yeah, and so to all of you guys, um, you know, how can we how can we think about some of the concepts from from uh, this overview that I gave or you know the, the class in general to think about um, analyzing this this policy um, yeah so who, maybe uh, maybe we can start off by thinking about what would the impacts of this policy be I mean, one obvious impact is it looks like it incentivizes people to buy more efficient cars by 
reducing the price of them and de-incentivizes people to buy the inefficient cars by uh, having an increased price. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that's that's kind of your direct outcome, right? Um, you want you want essentially more types of a, a sp uh, one kind of vehicle um, to to be sold. Um, there is this particular diagram here that kind of shows how that happens. So you know the more fuel efficient it is, the larger the rebate, and the less fuel efficient it is, the larger the fee. Um, so how might we think about the design of this program? Uh, we're getting more into kind of, kind of the details here. Um, I mean, so would, wouldn't this require like, you know, you'd have to be, the fees would have to equal the rebate. So like you'd have to keep changing, like maybe the, the pivot point or, or keep changing the, the fees so that there's enough people buying inefficient, what quote unquote inefficient vehicles to like fund the, the rebate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, um, that, that's exactly right. Uh, and, and this is the kind of uh, important thinking that goes into the, the sort of design, because if you want more people to be buying, you know, the fuel efficient vehicles and fewer people to be buying the fuel inefficient vehicles, then, uh, then you're not going to have over time, right, the amount of money that you get from the fees is going to start going down and the money that you want to be giving out as rebates is going to be going up. So, so the solution you're proposing is either we like shift up this pivot point as the, that whole line goes up or you make the fees larger. So I guess you make the line like steeper down here, right? Um, yeah, that's, I, that that's right um and i think in most proposals that, that i've heard usually it's like the, the the pivot point moving but i guess you you could do it with with fees as well um in terms of structuring the 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 fee bait if you do it just like this with a straight line, um, let's see who, what types of people are going to get be uh, uh, getting affected the most. So typically, the lower income people would be affected the most because they would be prone to buying the most inefficient or secondhand cars. Uh, okay, is I guess how would you? How would you know that? I, I guess I, I, I might push back a little bit in, in that um, you're, so you, so that would be well, actually, yeah, Sorry, uh, no, so it could be both ways. It could be the higher income, but those who just choose to buy a certain kind of vehicle type that, that uh, you know, let's yes. say preference for more torque, more power. And so I want a gas guzzler and I don't want an EV. But yeah, I could still yeah. be feeling efficient on the higher side. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, I, so I'm, okay, there's some, I mean, I actually have looked at this a little bit and it's, it's not entirely clear um, that like low income people would be the most affected. Although, you know, that's something that would be important to look at, especially for issues of, of equity. But I think what you're saying is, is right, which is certain types of vehicle or the people who buy certain types of vehicle would be the ones most affected. So what what vehicles would be sort of getting lot big rebates and what vehicles would be getting um, uh, the biggest fees? So then you'd, you'd have to find a threshold fuel efficiency level uh, below which you don't tax and above which uh, you would tax more than 
Um, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm asking more generically, like, are there certain types of vehicles that would be big, uh, sort of on, on average would pay larger fees? And, and are there certain types of vehicles that on average would pay or would get larger rebates? And, and what, what so might the, those be? The bigger SUVs would probably pay more fees while yeah. the smaller cars would pay less fees. Yeah, right? it, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and, and that's, that's what you would see. You would essentially see, right, your SUVs and your trucks would be paying big fees and then your, the rest of your cars uh, and then smaller vehicles, the smaller the vehicles are, usually they're they're going to be more fuel efficient are, are going to be getting uh larger rebates um okay is this problematic at all yeah i mean i think it, it raises some equity issues in in terms of what people require their vehicles for so mm -hmm. if you need like if somebody has you know six children they can't drive a smart car like it's not possible yep so you know, you're creating issues like that. And if somebody, you know, uh, is, you know, an agricultural worker who requires a truck to get to the point, place that they work every day, then they need something that can do that. And so they're being disadvantaged by the program. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, and, and so you, you start to worry about, uh, about this type of issue in, in terms of uh, equity. Um, I think that's, that's probably, uh, that that's not actually the thing that I was thinking of, but it's probably more important than the than the thing that I was thinking of, um, which is that it's it's also uh, I, I don't know <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say equity, but but it is kind of an equity concern for automakers too, right? Um, because some automakers are more prone to building large SUVs and trucks, and and some automakers are going to be building, um, you know, more uh, like your hybrids and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, I had a question here. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, like, is there any necessity that uh, we are discussing to implement this based on the size of the car? I was thinking how about to implement such a thing, like in the terms of the auto ownership, like mm -hmm. those who are owning more than one or two cars pay more uh like again as those that have a lower ownership instead of like implementing it just in the terms of the size or the weight of the car yeah well so this particular policy it uh you know the the ownership i guess is not really sort of factored in but um the, but right so the way this is structured it's, it's just fuel efficiency right uh, but I think it is possible kind of, I think what, what you're alluding to is that you could additionally break it down by like size or class or, or weight. And, and that would, um, that would in, in some regards help that equity issue so that you say, oh, instead of doing it as trucks versus versus cars for example it could be you know dirty trucks versus clean trucks and dirty cars versus clean cars um and and in fact that's a lot of how uh that 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 is how fee baits are often broken down um discussions about this this type of policy in, in the u.s is usually has some kind of kind of breakdown like that um, there is, there is one worry about, um, separating like classes, like say you were to break it down into to cars and trucks, which is a little bit more, more nuanced, but the argument goes that, um, you know, in the case where pe people need them, then, then you've incentivized the, the that kind of switching, but you've also possibly incentivized switching where you might go from a bad car to a good truck, right? Because I'd have to pay a fee if it was the car, but I would get a rebate if it was the truck. Um, 
and and that switch could be in theory you know worse for for the environment so that that is one sort of issue to consider um i, I do want to go back to uh the the original um uh, uh, what, what Scott was saying about thinking about in, the direct impacts, which are um, which are basically the the adoption of, of specific types of vehicles. Um, if I were some policy analyst, or or, or suppose I were the um, um, Senator or, or congressman or you know representative who wanted to pass a bill on this, um, what what other impacts might might I care about? Um, so so I guess we we talked about equity, uh, but just changing the the number of cars that's kind of a a means to an end, right? And so what what end would would that be? Any ideas? Could you maybe rephrase the question? Uh, yeah. So, uh, why do we want cleaner cars on the road? Lower emissions. Lower emissions. Yes, exactly. Uh, and and so, you know, it it maybe it's it's a little kind of straightforward, right? But translating from number of vehicles to uh, emission impacts um that is you know that that's something that would be important for uh for, for understanding the effects of like a, a a program like this um thinking about uh costs as well right um you know when you when you put something like this in, in place it it's gonna force automakers to kind of rejigger um how they decide to deploy their, you know, fleet of, of uh, models that they, they want to sell the public. And so, um, you know, measuring some of those impacts could be uh, important for, um, for doing this or, or for having like a comprehensive policy analysis as well. Um, yeah, but but I think, I think we've, we've hit a lot of the sort of major points here. Um, let me see anything else about this. Uh, probably the probably the million dollar question um, that we that maybe we we've we've glossed over is is in, in actually measuring and understanding the the change in adoption and and how that would happen. So, you know, I put in this price change and then people start adopting different vehicles. Um, and, and I think that that is probably the hardest thing to do. You can think about um, employing things like consumer choice models, um, which, which I don't think we, we, we didn't actually cover that in, in this class, but um, that would be one possible way of doing it. You could, you could run uh, surveys, you could do sort of natural experiments to look at like price changes. Um, but so there, there's, there's a couple different um, approaches you could take to, to do that. But once you have a sense of, of that number, it, it's, I think, straightforward using a lot of the sort of methods we've talked about in, in this class to, to get at a lot of the other impacts. Um, okay, good. So let's maybe look at a different example. Uh, okay, building energy efficiency standards. Um, so this is definitely more in, in the wheelhouse of, of some of you guys um, who are uh, more into uh, this than, than the transportation side. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lean on some of you, some of you to, uh, to help think about this. 
Um, usually, right, energy efficiency standards contain both energy and water efficiency requirements. Um, it, and, and even though they're, they're called efficiency standards, they uh, are often coupled with indoor air quality requirements. Um, these are uh, often deployed for both new uh, and old buildings. Um, and they're standardized by, um, I guess, these energy budgets in the, that, that allows you to think about the application of, of efficiency standards to different types of buildings, right? Um, and so this, this often is like energy consumption per square foot of, of space. And this is a little example that, uh, that I grabbed from uh, California's uh, building energy efficiency standards. Um, yeah, and so why don't we think about, um, yeah, let's, let's have a discussion about this um, and, and maybe I'll sort of start off by uh, how do we do sort of standardization um, across different building types for different purposes? Um, how, I guess, how might you categorize these, these uh, standards? Well, I know for California's building efficiency standards, one way that they're categorized is by climate zone. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what climate you're in, but then also the building itself. I mean, there's two ways that these standards are implemented, which is prescriptive versus performance. So some are just like, you have to have an insulation in your walls that is this thick, mm -hmm. but others you can do, you can do trade-offs. Um, and you know have worse windows but better lighting and um, so yeah. that can be sort of adopted for different types of buildings particularly like if you want to have a high rise that's all windows you're going to have to get efficiency elsewhere okay great uh and why might we have um at a high level these two types of um approaches like one performance one prescriptive I mean, I think the goal is to not limit design options. You know, people want a certain look or feel to their building, but still require efficiency. I mean, buildings have a lot of different systems in them. So you want to be able to allow for those trade-offs because it mm -hmm. still leads to the eventual goal of increased efficiency. Is there any criteria on, on how... Um how a standard is required in terms of this uh, performance versus pres prescriptive. I mean, the, the classic criteria is cost effectiveness. I don't know if that's what you're looking for though. And technologically feasible. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, feasibility makes is that right? So feasibility makes sense with performance um, and cost of, and you want to make sure that cost effectiveness uh, would would uh, would be under kind of a certain threshold for prescriptive, right? Because you you wouldn't want um, you wouldn't want to like prescribe something that would be like way too expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like the prescriptive is kind of like the baseline, but a performance pathway is allowed to kind of allow some flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And what, what are some of the uh, challenges in, in implementation? I'll speak up again. I know a lot about the building code. Um, <laughs> one of the, the challenges is upfront costs pretty much always. We talk about cost effectiveness. I mean, you can see on this, this graphic right here, it says $19,000 in savings, but that's over a 30 year mortgage. Yep. Um, and the costs are usually you know, put upon builders and contractors, um, whereas the savings are realized by residents. 
Yeah, and and so uh, in a, I, I think this this kind of touches on um, some of the like economic analysis that that we covered in, in the class, right? So, you know, why why wouldn't everyone just do it? Um, the stakeholders are going to be fairly different for who's getting the benefits versus who's paying the costs, and also the sort of timeline makes a really big difference. Right. And so, um, yeah, so how, and, and, and I think this is kind of a, a question for everyone, like in the context of, of what we've, we've learned in class, there's a, there's a good way to, to think about this, right? Um, uh, different stakeholders have kind of different discount rates, which means that, um, you know, you, you, you're going to value the like upfront costs versus how you get your money back differently over time. And so how does that kind of concept factor into thinking about the, the costs versus savings in a problem like this? So let me let me maybe re reframe the question um, in in a way. Well, okay, this I actually don't don't know the answer to this, but um, but I, I guess I'm I'm expecting it to be a, a, a certain way. Um, do we do we generally find that efficiency standards are easier or harder to implement for say uh, residential buildings versus for say commercial buildings? I, I would say it's harder for residential. Um, you're dealing with uh, builders who are afraid that like they'll, if they put too much into a building, then they'll have like, uh, what's the, Sorry, I'm trying to come up with the appropriate word. like sticker shock, where like mm -hmm. they'll have to increase the initial price enough so that they won't be able to sell it. So why would they, you know, put in the extra efficiency measures that they might not be required to, or if it's going to decrease the the you know, their ability to sell the buildings. Whereas a commercial building is generally being built for the owner who's going to own it, and so they're going to see the value that they get back out of those efficiency measures. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So um, when we think about those concepts in a more generalized sense, right, it means the risk, uh, the risk factor for your uh, individuals owning, you know, the residential side um, is going to be really different from uh, you know, the commercial owners, uh, as well as um, the discount rates for how you're kind of viewing um, uh, the, the, the savings in, in the future. Uh, and, and because of that, you, I think that, that that's a fairly nice explanation for why um, you might have sort of different levels of, of, of adoption or, or I mean, not not even necessarily levels of adoption, but uh, you you might see really different behavior when it comes to um, thinking about these uh, efficiency standards. Um, okay, what about um, impacts and, and measuring impacts? How might we go about doing that? What what would be the impacts, and, and how would we measure them? I think the impacts, I mean, the main one being that they're building efficiency standards is accounting for the efficiency benefit or the energy saved. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that go into that calculation are looking at the stringency, how many houses are going to be built in the future, what the natural market adoption might be already, because you don't want to like account for savings that would have happened anyway. Yeah, that's, and actually that's, that's what I, uh, was hoping that that uh, that that you would mention, because um, that that 
in itself can be pretty tricky, right? Um, so how do you figure out the counterfactual? Like in, in, the, in a world where building energy efficiency standards didn't exist, would, um, would, the, would some of those you know, energy efficiency measures have been put into place anyways, because maybe they're just cost effective, right? Um, and so how, how would you go about thinking about that counterfactual issue? I mean, I know how it is done. I'd be curious what other people think how it should be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely uh, open discussion here. What do, what do other other folks think? No opinions. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so I guess we're 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 trying to think about um, uh, if I want to like categorize uh, or or figure out the impacts of the building energy efficiency standards. You could say, okay, well, how much energy energy do I save? And that seems to be kind of a straightforward um, question, but. In the absence of these standards, you know, it's it may not be the case that, or, or sorry, in, in the absence of these standards, it may be the case that some of those things that you would do to improve efficiency would happen anyways. And so it can be less straightforward to measure the energy savings, right? And so I guess that we know how it's, uh, we know how it's actually get, going to be done, um, but I'm curious if anyone has any opinions, especially if this is not your like area of expertise, how you think uh, we, we can approach that problem. I mean, if you can compare California to a similar state, which mm -hmm. did, did not enact such standards or something, or see how technology is being adopted elsewhere, then from that kind of determine the impact it had potentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, that's like a really nice sort of top-down approach. Um, this is a type of thing that like economists like to do, where you try and compare two things as similar as possible, and then you have like a, a discontinuity or like some kind of change that happens in one place compared to the other, and you see um, you see how how things are affected. Uh, I'm guessing that's not how it's actually done, right? So would you just look at at the usual technology maturity curve and then just make suitable assumptions saying that even if the standards didn't exist, then technology would move in a certain way and that would become the baseline? Uh, possibly. I, um, okay, I, so I, I will say that I, I don't actually know how it's done, but my thought about that would be um, I, I think it's a good idea, but I would worry that it's too generalized to get at a lot of the types of things that building energy efficiency standards would, would want to do because they because mm -hmm. they probably have lists of very, you know, specific uh, equipment and technologies that that would uh, need to be sort of uh, adopted. Um, but yeah, po possibly if you had the right uh, sort of technology curves for, for everything, you, um, it, it, it may be possible to do something like that. Yeah, so uh, I'll give the answer of how it's actually done. Um, it's done by a vast diffusion model. Oh, so yes. there's okay, only a wow. few parameters. <laughs> Yeah, they go, they go into it. It's, it's honestly pretty simplified. And what informs those parameters is, is looking at similar technologies and how their adoption went, mm -hmm. as well as like interviewing a bunch of people um, or just like 
random consultants like me picking some numbers that were similar to other technologies. Okay. So it's not the most technical, but it's a curve. Yeah, yeah. So so Aditya, you were you were spot on, I guess. That that is uh, that is how they do it. I'm yeah, I guess I'm surprised that you can have that for like so many, I guess, specific technologies, right? Yeah, I mean, so it's done on a measure level. So that means like like one measure could be window mm. to wall ratio. One measure could be wall fenestration. So it's for each technology itself. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's only a few factors that go into, I forget the name of, of the model, but the CPUC has a model for how they define energy savings from the building code. Yeah, very cool. Um, that's a that's a very like fascinating world. I wish I I, I knew knew more <laughs> uh, about it. So okay, well, um, I I'm gonna maybe put you on the spot a little bit, and um, I, I'm curious if there are um, any particular things in in your world, you know, uh, when we think about policy analysis that you you think sort of deserve some some mention? Sorry, did you mean me or everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You. Sorry. Oh, um, things that deserve mention. I think one of the things that's most broken in California is our cost effectiveness mm -hmm. um, quantification. I, I'm not the most knowledgeable about it, but I know everyone hates it. And the way it <laughs> looks at costs really, um, it undervalues energy savings, which has been fine up to today because it's always been super cost effective. Mm -hmm. But as we squeeze out more and more energy efficiency in California, we're running out of you know, that cost buffer. and like the utilities typically advocate and run these programs and they need to keep their, their TRC, which is like the ratio of costs of benefits to costs. Yeah. And it's supposed to be at like 1.2. Um, and there are some programs that are really, really short, um, small in terms of cost effectiveness. So the building code itself is like, has a crazy TRC. I think it's over 2.5. So lots of benefits to the costs. Yeah. Um, so th I think that's like the biggest area for improvement, especially as California moves forward. Um, as far as the building efficiency, of energy efficiency standards, I think the most controversial piece was the 2019 energy code for residential required rooftop solar. Um, yeah. <laughs> just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, uh, I think our, our cost effectiveness calculations for that particular measure were broken because it didn't account for who's paying those costs and the fact that California is in a housing shortage to start with. And now there's gonna be a disincentive for new build. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that I do do remember and have had some interesting conversations about. Um, but yeah, I think that cost effective to, to metric uh, issue is, is very interesting. Um, I wonder why they, uh, I mean, would it be possible to just recalibrate um, that metric to like historical data? Uh, it strikes me that if there's a disconnect between what they want versus what is actually happening, um, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe looking at historical values might be a way of, of recalibrating that but uh, yeah so I, 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 I <laughs> I'm, I'm little I'm speaking I guess a little out of my my depth here so I don't want to oversimplify yeah no I think it's it's not that the past is broken it's just that the calculation itself is overly stringent mm -hmm. and a lot of where folks are looking for for innovation and particularly in efficiency is things like market transformation programs which are not cost effective unless you look over a much longer lifetime and savings are discounted. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, we can't really claim savings 40 years out as much as we would need to, to, to run a market transformation program where there's a huge upfront investment and savings mm -hmm. later. 
Yeah, it makes makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and and I think more generally speaks to to this example that like once you're uh, um, sort of embroiled in uh, in the topic, like you start to see a lot of these um, places for for improvement and and uh, yeah, that's I, I sort of really encourage all of you to be active in, in, in this field when when um, thinking about these issues because because I think that's that's where um, you, you're going to be able to make make a big difference here. So um, okay, let's uh, let's take a quick break here. Um, five minutes and uh, and then we'll we'll dive back into it with um, some some other policies.
Okay, let's get back into it. Um, so the next one I wanted to talk about, um, it's not necessarily a, a specific policy per se, but um, there is, uh, it's, it's more of a sort of technology um, support. Um, and, and so, so for those who don't know, carbon capture and sequestration is a particular type of technology. Uh, it's often talked about in coupling with fossil fuel plants. Um, and it's essentially a way that you can capture CO2 um, and then store them as, as gas underground. Um, so the, so the, the reason why you typically see, um, you see this technology deployed at a power plant as opposed to sort of just um, uh, sequestering from, from um, uh, open, open air, which is, which is actually a thing, is that the concentration of CO2 is, is much higher when you're doing combustion, right? Um, it's one of the very few technologies that is net negative in, in carbon as opposed to sort of net zero. You know, we think about renewables being, you know, uh, essentially net zero because they don't emit anything when they produce power. Um, but, but this actually, uh, it's, it's possible to have uh, net negative, especially if you are using um, like biomass um, based uh, biomass derived fuels uh, to, to uh, produce energy um, because that biomass is generated initially from sucking in CO2 from, from the atmosphere. So you end up getting uh, what's known as net negative. Um, okay, so I guess the question is, uh, maybe the, the sort of generic question that I'll start with to, to pose to all of you is, um, should we support this technology through policy? Um, so su supporting carbon captures all might be seen as like incentivizing carbon dioxide or uh, subsidizing like the production of CO2, which seems like counterintuitive since our, the goal is to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, okay, hang on. Let me, let me break that down. So you, so, um, the, you, you're saying that you don't want to do this because it would allow for like fossil fuels to continue operating. Is that is that the sort of premise? Mm, I guess so. Like, uh, it doesn't it doesn't incentivize polluters or emitters of CO two to stop emitting. Uh, okay, so um, yes. So I, I understand your argument and let me play. I would, sort of I would, uh, I would chime in and say that it, it might because it, it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> or well, at least the technologies that we have so far are quite, quite expensive. And so yeah. if, so, if okay. the leaders so, uh, required to, to do this, then it might incentivize them to create, uh, produce less. It's yes. like polluters have to pay for this. Yeah, well, okay, H hang on. So I think the cost issue is one of the central things to think about, but, but even before that, I guess, um, uh, uh, let me get back to something I think more fundamental about what, what Trisha is saying. And, and I'm, I'd be very curious to think what the rest, what rest of you guys think. Um, so let's, let's hypothetically suppose that cost isn't really an issue. And let's suppose that like, the technology itself is um, sort of super well developed uh, and 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 works, um, you know, as as advertised. Um, I guess in that sense, like if I hook up CCS to all of my natural gas plants and coal plants out there, um, do we? 
do you care, do you, do you care that the fossil fuels are still being used, even if they don't emit any CO2? Uh, you might just because they are a limited resource is like one of the key issues with them. Okay. So to me, it makes sense to sort of subsidize carbon capture and sequestration and then slowly wean off of that, trying to push energy mm. producers into uh, energy sources that are not so expendable and are more okay. valuable. Yeah. So, so that argument is one of sustainability, right? Like we couldn't, like even if it didn't emit carbon, we couldn't burn uh, coal and natural gas forever. Yeah, and, and I think that that's, that's uh, a, definitely a, a sort of fair view of this. But that's the same problem with hydrogen too, right? I mean, even if that's a renewable source, we have the same argument of CCS for hydrogen because if we had to make it viable, then it would be the, the worst way to do it. Uh, wait, I'm not following your argument. Why, why is, uh, uh, hydrogen, the, uh, the worst, worst way? So, I mean, even hydrogen has, 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 uh, way more CO2 emissions than if we were to do it. I mean, uh, and, or if you needed to do it through renewables, then the costs are significantly higher, which is okay. why people have been promoting CCS with hydrogen as well. Yeah. But, uh, but when you do that, then it just makes no sense. Uh, you might as well just do fossil fuel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, there, I mean, the distinction is that like, you can use hydrogen in the vehicles, but you can't use like, it'd be a lot harder to use uh, like coal in, <laughs> in the vehicle. But yeah, it, it, but that but that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, you, you lose a lot of efficiency and you add a lot of cost to, to doing something like this. Um, so Daniel, I think you hit this sort of nail on the head, which is, which is cost, um, which ends up being one of the uh, most difficult factors um, around this technology is, is that it's, it's really, really expensive. Um, and besides that, yeah, that the whole question of whether or not you allow fossil fuels to continue, even if you do have CCS, um, as it pertains to sustainability is, is, is still, uh, is still an issue. Isn't there, isn't there also just like a huge risk of like, we just don't know if the carbon dioxide would stay in the ground for a hundred years, which it would need to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, with it. I do remember reading some, some papers about this actually. So there's a, there's a big leakage worry that, um, you, you keep putting CO2 down there uh, in, in your sort of uh, aquifer or storage area. And um, it's, a fairly, uh, it's a fairly small molecule. Um, and, and so it could potentially kind of leak and, uh, and, and you might not even know it, right? Um, and, and that is uh, one of the sort of technical challenges, right? Um, and and so, you know, we have both, we have kind of this uh, trifecta of, of things going on where you have a bunch of technical challenges. Um, so, so we mentioned about whether or not the storage can actually handle the CO2. There's also the issue of collecting the CO2, which is a energy in intensive and fairly inefficient process. Um, so you've got all your technical challenges uh, and then you've got all of your sort of cost challenges. Um, you know, this being, uh, if, we're, if we're strictly thinking about decarbonization, you know, its counterpart is like moving to renewables, right? And so uh, you would want to be thinking about the cost of a system like this relative to how much CO2 it would be decreasing compared to just installing like renewable uh, resources, um, which, which can be not as, as straightforward to compare. Um, and then uh, the last one is the sustainability issue um, regarding the resource use, which uh, isn't solved by, by CCS um, necessarily for, for fossil fuels. Although some people are thinking about using it with with bioenergy, in, in which case you might be able to, to get around that particular issue. 
Um, so it sounds like uh, fr from from a lot of folks that that we shouldn't be supporting this technology through policy. Is 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 that right? Just to advocate for it, don't most of the kind of climate scenarios that we have to to reach our goals, don't most of them use CCS? So wouldn't it make sense to have some type of support for the technology if we are trying to rely on it to meet our goals? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so that's that's probably the sort of key argument for this type of technology, um, which is that you can't get to, you know, whatever degree target or, you know, specific emissions target um, because it's too hard to, de to decarbonize certain things. Um, and, and that's that's actually where some of that sort of policy analysis could come into play is, you know, we think about um, the, the sort of options we have of decarbonization. Um, and there are things sort of way at the top at the end that you would need to do that may actually end up being less efficient and more expensive than CCS. And so instead of decarbonizing those, you may say, okay, we'll just, we'll just do carbon capture in, instead. Um, yeah, and, and so if one were to come up with a sort of policy analysis position to support this technology, I think that's probably what you would wanna demonstrate. Um, is is a comparison of this against some of those sort of least uh, efficient things. Um, yeah, I, I think in my mind uh, that getting to that point is probably still kind of a long ways off. There, we're we're so far away from our sort of you know one hundred percent decarbonization. Those like 2040, 2045, 2050 uh, goals um that you're probably well I, I mean i'm not an oracle or anything but I, I would say you probably won't see that type of thing come up uh for for this paul for uh to support this type of technology um for for a little little while uh it's probably still going to be kind of more in the r d phase than in the implementation phase Um, okay, so let's now move on to a fairly different uh, policy. Um, sustainable land use. Uh, so this is not just kind of one uh, policy kind of in, in the same manner that, that we've been talking about. Um, in the last couple examples. Um, and so sustainable land use policy is a really sort of broad um, generalization for, for a series of policies that basically answer this question of how we can sustainably occupy and use uh, developed land. Um, and they vary in scope and, and size and, and, and magnitude. Um, this, uh, this picture that, that I, that I, um, have here is, is actually an example, a really sort of simple example of, of this in, in San Francisco that was implemented, um, somewhat recently, uh, I think at the end of 2018, um, where and I don't know if, if folks have, have seen this recently, but sort of on, on, um, on, on a lot of the sort of large um, main streets, I think on, on, on Mission, uh, for example, they painted the bus lanes red um, as, as a signal for people to um, uh, that that not not to use these lanes essentially, and actually a lot of these lanes were so they're meant to be exclusive for buses and, and taxis, um, and and actually it has been like that for a long time, but there were so many sort of violations of it 
so they, they ended up doing something this really simple where you would just um, uh, paint the lane red and, and it had a really sort of profound impact on, on congestion on those roads, um, increased mobility, decreasing travel times, um, increased use of public transit. There are all these things that uh, is actually very sort of uh, astounding that that all they had to do was paint the road red and you get all these massive, uh, massive benefits. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of just one really sort of simple example of um, a uh, sort of restructuring your, your land use to essentially better support um, mobility in general, but you know, public transit and, um, and, and access. Uh, so, so the types of things um, that I guess I'm most familiar with in, in transportation, although obviously land use affects many other other sectors. Um, so encouraging public tr transportation, discouraging sprawl, um, supporting sort of active transit over vehicle ownership. So there are many, many examples of programs where they like they take a four lane street and they convert it into, you know, just two lanes and then they have extra support for like protected bike lanes and, and larger sidewalks um, and uh, a lot of, you know, um, uh, sort of support for, for active transit essentially. Um, yeah, and, and so for so for folks who are, who I'll, I'll just really briefly say that um, for folks who are interested in, in this topic, you know, take some classes uh, from uh, Susan Handy. She's a professor uh, in um, ESP and is one of the sort of lead specialists in, in the entire world on, on, on this topic. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess this particular policy or set of policies is, um, is fairly broad. Uh, and so what are, what are some of the outcomes uh, or and, and impacts that we might see as a result of, of, of this policy uh, or, or you know this these suite of policies? It's kind of a, a tough thing to think about. I can think of an example being policies that just limit the amount of parking lots in hopes mm -hmm. that that would mean folks would take public transit, but I know I've heard examples where that just means a bunch of people take rideshare services and it's still vehicles travel. So yeah. it's hard to model a future scenario when there's so many variables. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's a very uh, sort of insightful um, way of getting it at the core of the problem. Um, there are a couple things to, to think about here, right? Um, that, that make this policy a lot less straightforward than some of the ones that, that we've been talking about. Um, and oftentimes uh, that's related to sort of the, the magnitude uh, of the change can have a lot of really uncertain impacts because you might have like unintended consequences that, that may be difficult to foresee. And, and that just makes um, sort of policy analysis harder, but uh, you know, if you if you do it well, you might be able to capture a lot of that in you know uncertainty analysis or scenario analysis. Um, and then the other thing, uh, the the other thing that I think you somewhat alluded to is this idea of okay, if, if we're thinking about one specific outcome, I might be able to sort of quantify that, right? So um, in, in the example that, that you gave, you know, if I reduce, um, if I reduce the number of, of parking spaces, uh, maybe, you know, that decreases um, individual sort of vehicle use, uh, but then, you know, if, if that's if that's the specific outcome that I want, then then maybe you're kind of successful along those lines. But 
you know, there, there are a whole bunch of other uh, potential outcomes, right? Uh, so one is, is mobility um, and, and it's unclear whether or not you've necessarily improved uh, mobility um, by, by, you know, putting in that specific policy. Um, and then where it starts to really get complicated is where you think about uh, trade-offs um, between, between outcomes. So maybe you are improving uh, energy, um, energy use or emission savings, right, um, with a particular program. And so what, like, I'll, I'll give a really sort of crude example. Um, let's say if I were, uh, if I were like a city planner in, in, in Davis and I just said, okay, get rid of all the roads and we're only going to have bike lanes from now on. And, uh, you know, your immediate outcomes might be really big, uh, sort of energy savings and emissions reductions, you know, within, within the city. Um, but you may be, in, in theory, you could be decreasing, um, you know, quality of life and, and uh, mobility by putting in a, a, a program like that. And so, you know, how are we supposed to value these, these trade-offs and in, in outcomes? Um, yeah, I guess, does anyone have any um, particular thoughts about these types of, of policies or any other, um, uh, what should I say, um, like concerns that you've thought about with, with these types of policies? Uh, I oh. have a, oh, go oh, ahead. Go no, no, no. <laughs> um, I was just going to add that uh, sometimes these kind of policies might uh, exacerbate uh, income disparities or uh, access from di to disadvantaged communities, like, mm -hmm. and they might encourage, like, high income people to move into the area or, or to use the facilities more option more often and raise, raise prices. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, that some types of things that we think about as, you know, going to be really environmentally beneficial might be uh, not such a big deal for certain types of populations, but may have adverse effects on other types of populations. So land use for sure is going to be one of the big ones that's going to affect, um, you know, equity uh, issues and environmental justice. And so uh, it, yeah, yeah, again, one of these things that becomes very sort of uh, complicated when, when we're thinking about um, how to value diff different sorts of, of outcomes. And yeah, I, I think it's probably one of the sort of hardest areas to, to get right, unfortunately. Sarah, did you want to? Yeah, so I was just going to add that I feel like with these policies, it's also really important to catch kind of like the changes that you think are essential early on. And I say that because I come from, I'm from a town outside of Las Vegas, but I did my undergrad and my master's in Las Vegas. And I don't know if anyone has ever been there, but it is like the perfect example of a sprawled city. So if we take the example of like removing parking lots from several stores, Basically, I would have to choose a different store that's maybe even further to drive to because there aren't, there isn't infrastructure or any other mode to access the grocery store with other than my car. So I feel like Vegas is a really good example of why you have to make these changes really early on mm -hmm. is it's already so spread out that one kind of land use change wouldn't fix anything. It would actually probably hurt the people in the businesses that are there. Because even if you look at like, maybe they put a bus route that goes to that grocery store where they remove the parking lot. Las Vegas is so spread out that some people might be looking at like a bus ride that's over an hour for a car ride that might've been like 20 minutes. And there are places in Las Vegas that are not accessible by bus. Mm -hmm. like a lot of places in Las Vegas that are not accessible by bus. So I feel like it's really important 
like you can't just make one change at a time. It also almost has to be done as like a group of changes, especially in places that are already sprawled or yeah, like the population density isn't particularly high. Yeah, uh, that's a great example. I think it hits on basically a lot of a lot of the sort of difficulty, the fundamental difficulties of, of doing something like this. And um, it's, it's not only that you have to like make all these changes at once, it's, it's even, you know, when you think about these um, policies in the first place, they may be well-intentioned, but it can be really tricky to get the right outcome. Um, you can have all these side effects that happen, like like the ones that that you were pointing out, um, and and it's it's also really difficult because these are fundamentally really long lasting, long term um, designs, right? And and it can be hard to to, to kind of see see what happens um, when you when you implement things like that. Uh, I think the like classic example that that everyone sort of talks about um, in terms of, in terms of uh, kind of unintended consequences is the like sprawl of highways that were uh, put into place in, in Los Angeles right back um, you know 50, 50 60 years ago and um, you know the original thought was that hey we can alleviate traffic by just building more freeways um, but what ends up happening is uh, you end up diverting a lot of traffic onto these arterials and you have a lot of uh, expansion and growth in areas where you, you have uh, sort of freeway access uh, and, and you just end up with more, uh, actually more congestion um, because it attracts, it essentially attracts more people. Um, and, and so that was kind of a spectacularly failed um, uh, sort of land use policy in, in that it, it in the long run it, it achieved the exact opposite of what they were trying to do. I was just going to give another example of um, in Las Vegas, especially near the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, they at one point the bus system is probably the strongest in that area throughout all of the Las Vegas area. And they had tried to improve kind of like the, the sidewalks and the pedestrian and bike accessibility in the area. <clears throat> and they made several major steps to try to improve this area and it had a huge unintended consequence of they implemented all of these different crosswalks, but they weren't necessarily consistent with how they were marking the crosswalks or like some of them were flashing, had the flashing beacon all the time and then others only flashed when there was a pedestrian there. So the way that they implemented it was not consistent and it ended up being like one of the most dangerous places for pedestrians, oh. I would guess, in the state, possibly the country, there's a really high rate of pedestrian fatalities in this area because the crosswalks, for one, they're crossing sometimes like six or eight lanes total and the lighting isn't great and they were inconsistent with how they're indicating that there's someone there. Yeah. So they tried and it ended up being way worse than it was before. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's all kinds of uh, examples of this, um, un unfortunately. Um, yeah, and, and it makes it uh, sort of very, again, fun fundamentally uh, difficult to, to get right. Um, you know, but that being said, hopefully um, some of the tools and, and critical thinking that we've been trying to apply uh, can, can help with, um, can help sort of better understand a lot of these issues if, um, you, even if you're not sort of necessarily solving all of them. Uh, okay, so let's do uh, one more. So this is uh, related um, to some 
some of the policies we've, we've talked about before, it's, it's kind of this larger fundamental one. Um, and we've talked about cap and trade, but I guess we haven't sort of really talked about um, an implementation of, of a, a carbon tax. Um, and the idea is very simple. We internalize the externality of, of carbon emissions, um, right? And so this is as sort of applied um, to anyone who's um, emitting carbon and you'd have to pay this sort of extra amount of money in, in sort of dollars per, per ton. And they have uh, the, the social cost of carbon um, is determined through, you know, these um, integrated assessment models that, that are able to figure out sort of the marginal damages of, of CO2 and, um, and the costs associated with that. Uh, a couple countries have adopted a, a carbon tax, a couple countries and regions. Um, and so there's this, this list here and, and the tax that they uh, el elicit is um, anywhere between sort of 20, $24 to $140 a, a ton. Um, okay, so I thought that I might leave this up a little bit more sort of generically and, and kind of see uh, what you guys think about um, uh, a carbon tax. So does anyone have any particular opinions? Uh, is this the kind of best policy we can do or, or is, it a, is it a terrible policy? What do, what do you guys think? Um, I'm curious, this is just a question. I'm curious if like how, if anyone knows like how like regressive of a tax it would be or, or like, I don't know. I, I haven't looked very like far into who it would end up affecting and who it wouldn't or like how it would be passed on to just normal people. But I don't know if anybody has a good sense of that. It depends, right? I mean, uh, the carbon tax goes with the polluter pays principle. Uh, so like, for example, in India, we tax coal production, uh, we tax about $6 for every ton of coal production. And that's supposed to be basically the implicit cost of the emission of the carbon emissions that come out of uh, the use of that coal. Um, but typically what happens is that since it's largely used, let's say in the power sector, uh, if you just kind of divide all of that incremental additional cost for the generator across millions of consumers, then the implicit social cost is really very limited. And so people don't really realize the impact of that um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the impact on the end consumer, so to speak. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, yeah, sort of, so, so, so I think that, that kind of points out your original question, um, which is when we think about the, the regressive nature of it, there's like a sort of baseline, right, of, uh, of, of consumption. And so, you know, how, how does uh, your personal carbon emissions kind of scale up um, relative to your income, right? And so if the carbon emissions uh, increase like proportionally faster than your income increases, then it would be I guess the, I guess it would be regressive, but in, in the other direction, right? It would like, like higher income people would, would pay proportionally more. Um, and then if it's, if it's, if your income goes up faster than your carbon emissions proportionally, then, then it would be what we sort of traditionally think of as, as regressive. And um, I think it's been kind of well-documented. Um, there, there are a couple studies about this that show it, it is more kind of the latter. So, so we do think that, that uh, the carbon tax is, is gonna be um, regressive. It's, it'll be similar to, uh, you know, think of, think of like, a, uh, like a, a gasoline tax, right? You know, uh, rich people pay more because they'll drive more. Um, so, I mean, that's a big generalization, but, but that sort of proportion is, is, is kind of similar to the cons consumption that we'd see in, in carbon taxes. And, and that's why 
in a lot of proposals for carbon taxes, they typically uh, have like these uh, rebates going back to, you know, um, consumers below a certain income threshold to get around the regressive nature of, of the tax. Um, okay. What do you guys think about um, uh, carbon taxes? Uh, and, and maybe I'm kind of hinting at that with, with, this, um, with this chart here. Uh, carbon taxes are supposed to internalize the externality, right? Uh, and how do we actually quantify that externality? And is there sort of uncertainty a, a, about it? I mean, as you can see from your graph, there's a lot of uncertainty as to like how much the externality of, I guess, a ton of metric ton of carbon is. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you wouldn't want to tax it too much or else you're decreasing people's quality of life to potentially save kind of less, to have like less of a benefit in the future. Um, so I guess it's difficult to know exactly how much to tax it, but yeah, I guess yeah. some like a small or a conservative, like settling on a small conservative tax would probably still have benefits. Yeah, that's a uh, that is definitely a a, a concern, right? In, in that um, you know there there is this sort of range of values that we're not entirely certain exactly what the, those damages are, uh, and, and that makes a lot of sense too, right? You're talking about like figuring out how a marginal amount of CO2 is going to affect like your entire global eco ecosystem. Um, and, and so that's less straightforward. But, but the other thing is that, right, the way in which we value those, those damages also depends on how much you value, you know, the, the future. And, and that, that kind of depends on, on sort of your, your discount rate. And you can see that under different assumptions of the discount rate, it can be really, really different, um, uh, in, in, right? In terms of magnitude of, of your, uh, uh, of the tax that, that you would in theory want to, want to assess. Um, and, and so that's one sort of difficulty. Um, Let's see, what other, does anyone have any, any other sort of thoughts or concerns about carbon tax um, and maybe any opinions about carbon tax as it relates to uh, other, other mechanisms like cap and trade, if you we were talking about in, in the market or, you know, or, you know, would we prefer a carbon tax to uh, direct subsidies or incentives or penalties uh, for for specific technologies. Does anyone have a, a any opinions on that? I mean, I <clears throat> I like the the idea of a carbon tax as a as a direct you know uh, implementation of of you know putting value on on future. Uh, cost of carbon uh, uh, but i think it's it's a very tricky thing to implement because for instance like you're looking at here like the the idea that i mean uh, people's discount rates their their idea of of that future value is so varied i mean i know that in in i can't re quite remember when i know it was more than five years ago but australia had a carbon tax they implemented mm -hmm. and it lasted like three or four years or something and then it was revoked and it's like what's the chance that they're going to be able to come up with a better version of it and put it back in now yeah. that they've already failed one time you know and so i think it's i mean even just the the language of it carbon tax like is problematic you know versus like incentivizing or you know cap and trade <laughs> like just the language itself it, it 
has so much more negative resonance with with the public that it's yeah. it's hard it's it's a dangerous thing to implement i mean i like it personally but my values are very specific right right and and it hasn't been so successful at um uh in 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 many other countries that had passed including including the us i also feel like it the reason a lot of like economists like it is because it doesn't necessarily like choose a technology or like uh you know favor i mean outright favor a technology like uh at the outset but in some sense, if we wanted, like, which I guess it just makes it a little harder to make these massive overhauls of our, like, you know, transportation yeah. systems and building, you know, HVAC systems, if there's not like a clear, I mean, it's a pretty clear signal, but it like, would be stronger if it was, uh, you know, a direct incentive for mm -hmm. manufacturing EVs or something. Yeah. Um... I don't, I don't know if any of you guys um, saw this this morning. There was um, uh, a debate organized um, between these two, two professors, actually one run from Davis. Um, I actually had never heard of this, this group that, that did this, but I guess they organized these, these sort of debates. And then the topic was about whether or not uh, electric vehicles should be sort of directly incentivized um, by, by the government. And, and the argument basically came down to, yeah, you know, should we be doing these like tax rebates and sub subsidies um, versus essentially like just doing a, a carbon tax? Uh, and, and it gets to a lot of these um, arguments and, and points that, that you guys are making, which, which I think is, is um, yeah, great that that uh you guys are echoing a lot of those 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 sentiments and and yeah i'll, I'll maybe i'll post a link of that um debate if, if anyone is interested uh but it did get me thinking about a, a couple um couple topics about carbon taxes um that that i think are are, are pretty interesting um yeah and i'd be curious <laughs> I'm kind of like spitballing some of my ideas here. I'd be curious to hear what, what you guys think. So, you know, a carbon tax is meant to, right? It's, it's meant to capture um, damages associated with, with any emissions, right? And, and we, we're emitting things because we're getting these really big benefits out of like driving cars and, and producing electricity. But the thing about the carbon tax is it's only, this like marginal increment for all future emissions once, once it's been implemented. Uh, economists will talk about how it's so much more efficient than like a direct subsidy because, you know, pointing to like Reese's example that, uh, that, it, that you can let the market decide the technology um, rather than having the government just, just choose one. Uh, but we've been, we've been emitting carbon for hundreds of years now in, uh, and, and all of that carbon emissions, uh, have led to these big social benefits, right? And so we captured all of those, we've, we've captured essentially all these really big benefits, but we haven't paid for any of the damages that have occurred over the last say 200 years as a result of, of, of emissions because there haven't been any carbon taxes until, until recently. And I, I don't know, I've been thinking that like a lot of these inefficient policies, these, these direct, you know, even if we're talking about these direct subsidies and, and, and that sort of thing, they're, they're less efficient than a carbon tax, but I almost think of it as like they're kind of paying back some of the damages that we should have been paying for in the past couple centuries, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a, a good way to, to, to think about it or um, I'm sure some economists would, would say I'm being silly, but I don't know if you guys have any opinions about that. Um, 
the the other point that uh, I'm not entirely convinced about is uh, is this idea that a free market would always get to a better end result than command and control. Um, and the way that I would pose this is that, okay, is it, do we always know the sort of like learning curve cost trajectory for any technology? And I think most people would agree that, that the answer is no, right? And so if we let the free market decide, if they can't see the endpoint, they'll choose the, the sort of technology that starts out the cheapest, right? And maybe it's the case that that technology can't move down to a, a low cost that another technology would that, that has sort of a high starting cost. And so, you know, if that's the technology that the government ends up picking, which I'm not saying they're guaranteed to do by any sort of stretch of the imagination, then, you know, it, it, there, there is a world in which picking and choosing winners may end up being more efficient in the long run than letting the market decide. Um, and and all, all I'm trying to say there is that the, the market may not always be 100% right. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so to that point, I, I think um, I'm not sure the answer is necessarily clear that, that it would be that, that picking and choosing winners is always worse than, than a carbon tax. Um, all right, I know I, I kind of went on a soapbox there, but does anyone, <laughs> does anyone have any, any thoughts or, or rebuttals um, to, to all of that? I was kind of thinking like to add to your argument about how the free market might not always choose um, the technology that's maybe most effective. I feel like it kind of relates back to when we're talking about like the social discount rate and ideally it would be very, very low, but in reality, like the way that people have estimated those of like different government agencies, it's not even close to what it should be. Mm -hmm. And I would guess that it's even worse for each individual. Like I would guess that the discount rate that I would choose for my great, great grandchild, like for that far yep. ahead would be even worse than maybe a government agency. So I feel like there's an argument in there as well for like me as an individual, I'm not good at considering what's going to happen way down the line based on a decision that I make. So there's some argument for the government or some kind of regulation to push you in a direction that kind of forces you to think about mm -hmm. what future generations will have to deal with based on the decision that you're making. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. It's like, oh, who who got to decide the social rate was, you know, 3%, you know, versus it, maybe you have a discount rate of like 0.1%, um, in which case, the ability of the carbon tax to internalize those those damages is is not doing a very good job, um, and and because of that, maybe it's it's better to have some other sort of non market based policy. Yeah, that that is a uh, that is a super <laughs> legitimate point that I think that um, uh, that that probably a lot of economists would would would. Uh, should 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 do a better job of, of thinking about for sure. Um, okay. Just just to yeah. understand another another like government policy that's still coming out of tax money. So you're still you're still paying for it, and the money's going into a technology that you might not not care about for the future. So. I don't see like it's it's just like more indirect it seems to me but it's still if you have a low discount rate you wouldn't care about investing in renewable technology no matter if it's coming from a direct carbon tax or an indirect government grant or something um 
Yeah, well, I think I think the point is that a lot of those costs get get passed down to you, um, and it's not so much that you have a sort of direct decision, um, or you 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 don't have a direct line into the decision making process of like what technologies end up getting supported. It's more that like because you have a carbon tax. Um, certain things get more expensive, certain things get relatively cheaper and the cheapest things will be the ones that, that end up getting supported. So when we talk about like uh, emission technology, like, or technologies that lead to emission decreases, um, be, the theory is that because the market is, is deciding in the most efficient way possible, you move, you move sort of up the curve instead of jumping to random places in the curve. Um, for, for emissions reductions technologies. Um, and, and that's the like basis of, of the argument for, for the carbon tax is that you, you should always be moving from the least cost solution to the highest cost solution, as opposed to, I guess, most of what folks are, uh, or economists um, will, will argue against, which is if I say, okay, we should adopt a bunch of electric vehicles, um, you, you've now sort of pointed to a place on the curve without necessarily looking at the, all the stuff in between. Yeah, and, and that's kind of like the, the fundamental argument of, of the carbon tax. Um, okay, good. Well, this was um, our, our sort of the last uh, um, policy example that I, that I have for today. Um, yeah, and so thanks for thanks to everyone for for participating. I know it was a little different from from the rest of uh, um, from the rest of the the uh, lectures that that we've done. Um, yeah, so hopefully everyone has has seen the schedule and will be uh, ready for for next week. Um, I will uh, make a post in the assignments so that you can. Um, submit the, the actual um, the project presentations um, and, and they'll be due on Monday just before class starts. Uh, other than that, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, yeah putting, putting up with all these these online lectures. Um, it'll be great to, to see you all in, in person at some point. Um, yeah, when, when, once we start doing in person again, definitely feel free feel free to swing by and, and, and say hi. Uh, happy to, to, to chat about, um, you know, this, this kind of stuff and, and your interests. So um, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's all we have for today. And, and so I'll, again, I'll stick around a couple minutes if anyone wants to chat. Um, otherwise, I'll see you on, on Monday. I've got a question about the final paper. 